Hello, my name is Lewis, and I'm coming to you with the Sunday School lesson for November 18th, and this lesson is entitled, Jacob's Dream. We'll be taking our text from Genesis 28, 10 through 22. And Jacob went out from Beth Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the, on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep. And he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city was called Luz at the, at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in, his, in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again into my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this scripture. Help us to understand the nature of Jacob's dream. Help us to understand the context. Give us nuggets to mull over over the course of this week that we may live by your word, live by your promises, trusting in you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we begin at verse 10. Where it says, and Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And uh, it behooves me to actually explain why he went out from Beersheba toward Haran. It is because after he had stolen the birthright, not only the birthright, but the blessing from his brother Esau that he was afraid for his life after it was told to him by his mom that Esau once his father once they finish mourning their father's death that Esau had it in his mind and his heart to kill his brother Jacob now I wanted to go actually go to that for a second and point out a nugget there uh, in Genesis chapter 27 I noticed something about Rebecca uh, something that that kind of st stuck out with, with, with me about this woman this woman is an amazing woman of God even though she was uh, a little um, a little tricky and and was looking out for her son and and had had favoritism toward her, her son she still was in contact with the Lord in some kind of way and, not, and the reason I say that is because of the following thing that I'm about to show you let me see if I can find it Yes, chapter 27 and verse 41, I'm going to begin there, but it's in verse 42. It says, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, what did Esau say? In his heart? Now, can we hear what's in people's hearts? Absolutely not. And this is why I'm bringing this out. He said in his heart, the days of mourning of my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. Now, who knew this? Nobody but God knows the, the nature of people's heart and the intents of people's hearts. And so God knew this. Nobody heard this outright. 
it was in Esau's heart. Verse 42, and these words of Esau, her, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. Now, who told Rebekah the words of Esau's heart? Now, I'm going to let you mull over that because time and time again, we see Rebekah uh, in last week's lesson, she overheard a conversation between Isaac and Esau. That's how she heard that but when you when you see in today in in this particular context in chapter 27 verse 41 and 42 she did not overhear anything she heard by someone somebody's heart and the words of somebody's heart and so i'm going to leave that alone but i just wanted to uh point that out about this woman now i think i think that was an interesting thing but not only that this is how jacob come to know about what Esau had planned for him. He came to know this by his mother being privy to something that was in his brother's heart. And so this is how he come to know uh, about, you know, his danger, the dangers that he would, he would be in. And so he was told by his mother, uh, go to my uncle's house, my, my, my family in Padanaram, and go find you a wife over there and stay over there for until your brother cools down. Same time, she goes ahead to to uh, Isaac and tells Isaac, you know, she kind of makes up a story to uh, for some, uh, not make up a story, but she didn't want her son Jacob to marry the people of, of Heth. If I'm not mistaken, I think the name of the, the city was Heth. And so, um, excuse me, somebody was just saying hello to me. So she was trying to get her, uh, yeah, it was the daughters of Heth. She didn't want her son marrying the people, the locals, the daughters of Heth, which was in the area. She wanted, uh, this is her reasoning behind telling Isaac who to go to for a wife. And so Isaac agreed. And in chapter 28, the verse, first couple of verses, it, it tells us that Isaac called his son Jacob and told him to go into your mother's family and go find you a wife from them, not from the daughters of Heth. And so this is why, why Isaac has told them, told Jacob to go there. Meanwhile, Esau understood that neither Isaac or Rebekah cared for the, the locals or any people from the Canaan lands. And so he all, he, 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 uh, Esau married someone from the Ishmaelites, Ish, Ishmaelites. And we remember the Ishmaelites to be the, uh, the descendants of Hagar and Abraham, uh, not the promised children, but nonetheless, it was not the people of Canaan. And, this, and Esau, you know, in his own in his own way try to you know do right by his family too in marrying you know in the family or marrying you know close to blood and so we come into today's lesson after he uh Jacob was told by Isaac to go to Padanaram and find your wife there this is why he's out coming from Beersheba going in towards Haran and so we're all caught up as far as that first couple of the first verse is concerned and so in his journey going toward Haran it says that he came to or he lighted upon a certain place now lighted upon just means he came to he came to a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set now in in the Middle East countries during that time where there was no light, no, um, no, um, what you call that false lights or, or, um, I can't think of the word. Oh my God. It starts with an a, um, artificial. There were no artificial lights, you know, like, you know, traffic lights, light bulbs, lights from buildings, lights, you know, in the streets or runways and stuff like that. So because there was no lights, when the sun went down, that was it. There was no light and it became very, very dark. So much so you cannot see where you're going. It's not even safe to try to walk. And so he did not. He came to a certain place and because the sun was set, he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows. Now, the only light that you might have is moonlight. The, the light from the stars and the, and the moon. 
during the nighttime. And so that was the only way he, he would be able to see during that time. He used stones for pillows. Now, that's an awesome thought in and of itself. Uh, stones usually does, doesn't mean anything. Usually you just, uh, you, you, um, you build things with stones and you just discard them. You throw them to the side. You move them out the way. Stone is a stone. But in this case, he used his stones to sleep, to rest his head on and sleep on it. Now, imagine that, the, the, the idea of sleeping on the stone. A person who's asleep, a person who is not awake. And, you know, in this day and age, we got this terminology called woke. If you're not woke, then you don't know nothing. You can't progress and you can't move forward because you're not woke. So Jacob used the stone to rest his head so that he can sleep. Just picture that for, as you will. Later on, you see that he used those very stones to, be, to make them a memorial, a pillar, um, not just some, some random statue or random place, but he used that and memorialized the area that he was in and created what, what we would probably regard as an altar or as you know, something erected to memorialize the occasion of something that he met with God at this place. And so he wasn't woke anymore. He was awoke. He was not just a random guy running away for his life. He had purpose at this point. And so that I wanted to show that there was some kind of correlation with that idea there too. Moving forward, I didn't want to stay there. Verse 12, and he dreamed and behold, a ladder set upon the earth. Now this is the dream. Remember, today's lesson is called Jacob's dream. And this is the man, Jacob, and he's asleep and he's having a dream. He, Behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God descending, ascending and descending on it. Now, what does this mean in this day and age? Not even moving forward, not going to the New Testament. And a lot of people like to go straight to uh, St. John chapter 1, uh, verse, I think, 49 to 51. Uh, where he where he's talking where he's picking out his apostles and saying follow me and he comes to Nathaniel and Nathaniel said oh indeed you are the Messiah you are the Messiah because and then Jesus said why because I told you where you were gonna be because I knew you were there that's you're gonna see a whole lot of things more than this uh, behold you're gonna see angels and de angels descending and ascending upon the son of God, the son of man. It actually says son of man, I think, meaning the man himself. And if you really think about it, it's, they're both correlated. Of course, Jesus would not use that, that idea without letting, without all uh, just in vain. He uses that on purpose because in that particular case, in John chapter one, he's talking to Nathaniel He's talking to the apostles. They're all Jewish. And he's talking to the, the mission that he's talking from the standpoint that he has a mission to do to perform among the Israelites. And the Israelites were going to see this. Not just Nathaniel, not just his chosen, not just the, the 12 apostles, but that Israel will now see angels descending and ascending upon the son of the son of man now how do we see angels descending and ascending upon the son of man did they literally see angels descending and ascending upon the son of man not really uh only one case i can think of where the uh, the apostle the three apostles uh saw jesus sharing space with uh with elijah and and um and moses but other than that, we don't really see angels. But, you know, that you can kind of creep in on that and say, you know, that might be what this talk. But no, I believe angels descending and ascending upon the Son of Man to be that miraculous works were going to be performed by this human being on earth. And he was going to be ministered to by these angels after doing such works. And remember, throughout Jesus's life, he did perform miracles he was in prayer early in the, early in the morning 
And he got up early to the marketplace and started performing his miracles and made a, made a big stink about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven approaching and being at hand, being here. It is here. And how do we know that? Because of the, the miracles that were happening, the wonders. And so I know I kind of uh, strayed away and went to St. John, but I didn't want to go too far in that. But the idea of what the Son of Man meant in St. John is the very idea that it, what it exactly means in today's lesson, which is that there is a ladder that's going to be set up that bridges the earth to heaven. And what comes up and down the, uh, that ladder are angels. And what it means is that these angels are going to perform works. They are messengers. They are people that they are beings that, that do the bidding of God in the earth. And you will see it manifest. And so Jacob is receiving this, this vision, this dream of something that has not yet happened. But it will happen because now God is about to make a declaration up on the top of that ladder. Now, the ladder, I got to say, is not necessarily uh, a wooden ladder or, you know, a ladder that we see today, you know, like made of steel and it has rungs on it. The ladder that we're, we're um, that this is most likely is, is a vision of a stair, a stepway, a staircase. Probably looks like um, probably looks like cement, something that looks, you know, to Jacob what is normal to him, and so a ladder may be what what appears to be like a ziggurat, and I, I've, I've read that in today's uh, Sunday school lesson, and they said that it could very well be, um, kind of like a ziggurat. But we're not we're not going as far as saying that it is a ziggurat or that it is like the ziggurats that are, are made by the Mayans or the Aztecs or uh, different um, different ancient civilizations that built up altars and stepways as though they're trying to make it to heaven. Not even like Babylon, uh, you know, when they try to build a staircase to heaven. And so, you know, uh, 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 some kind of worship center that reaches heaven. So it's not like that. It's not for that purpose. But the purpose was that the idea of a ladder and angels coming up and down on it, descending and ascending up on it from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven. The idea is very clear that there's going to be a bridge between the two realms, heaven and earth. And this bridge is a ladder. And we we come to find out in the New Testament where Jesus says of um, uh, not all uh, necessarily of himself, even though he says the Son of Man. Matter of fact, he does say that of himself. I gotta admit that he he rightly calls that ladder the Son of Man. That angels will ascend and descend upon the Son of Man, and so which makes the Son of Man a bridge or a ladder, a go between, a person who is used as a conduit between two places. And so God, Jesus, uh, is the man that God has put on earth in order to be by implication and by, and by, you know, uh, manifestation, you know, you know, the conduit of God in this world to perform such miracles and wonders on earth and also to declare salvation for those who would believe on him. And so I, I think I... Uh, stand, um, I stood on this scripture way too long. Verse 13 says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, Now the Lord stood above it. That means that Jacob saw an image of a person which looks like a person or someone or something standing there on top of the ladder. Notice that God does not touch down on earth. But the ladder actually touches earth. But the ladder, we'll, we'll find out in the New Testament, is an extension of God himself in that he has sent his son into the earth to be a ladder, to be a bridge. He himself, by his own right hand, we see that kind of language also in, in prophets, that, his, that, God, that God, by his own right hand, extended his right hand to save humanity. And to heal 
and to um, and to wash us himself. And so how do we know this? How do, how do we see this? It is by manifestation. We also see angels and uh, the angels of God descending and ascending. Uh, we know the angels perform the will of God. But this right here is a little more special in that the latter is God's extension of himself on earth. And that the angels of God would minister, you know, upon that ladder back and forth. And that's and, and it's indicative of what Jesus went through after he was baptized and went to the wilderness to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus, after he fasted, he was a hungered, he was tempted, he won the temptation, meaning he overcame it, and then after the temptation, he, uh, angels came to him and ministered to him. And so we see that constantly. Jesus always went into prayer. He bridged the, the idea that the idea of bridging between heaven and earth was was something that was personified in Jesus. Jesus always prayed to the Father in heaven. This is now how we will pray to the Father in heaven, but we will utilize the ladder. We can only get to God in heaven by utilizing the ladder. And so that's another thing. That's another, another nugget that we should take from that. And it says, uh, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. And the, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. God is now saying, I am the one who has been, you know, over your father Abraham. You know, Abraham is the, the, the leader of your pack, the leader of your tribe, the, the, the ruler. Remember last week's lesson how Isaac was tricked into blessing Jacob and the whole blessing was the idea of now um, forwarding all that rulership and leadership to one man, one king, not, not necessarily a king, but a ruler over that family. Why? Because it was necessary that God displays the culture of God through this family. He did it first with Abraham and Abraham... Uh, successfully engendered inside of Isaac the love of God and prayer and and meditation we saw that in, uh, with Isaac when when Rebecca saw him afar off that he was praying and we saw that throughout that not only was he praying but Rebecca was praying why because they were they were touched they were influenced by Abraham and Abraham influenced Isaac Isaac now influenced his family and his sons and influences those after him. Jacob being the one who is influenced. How else did he know who was talking to him above that ladder? It was God. It was the Lord. It was Yahweh. He understood who Yahweh was, who the one and only God was. It was the God that spoke to his grandfather, Abraham, and his father, Isaac, and also his mother. Remember um, in the beginning of the lesson today that I, I pointed out that Rebecca had remarkable um, insight into things that she should not have insight into, you know, people's hearts and their mind, their, uh, their ideas inside of their hearts. She knew that Esau, uh, you know, purposed in his heart to kill Jacob after they mourned their father. And again, their father wasn't dead. He was just old and coming near to death. And then the Isaac finally um, sends Jacob away and he's in this dream right now. Okay, moving forward. And so God mentions again, not only did he mention this to Abraham and to Isaac, but now he's mentioning, he's making the same covenant agreement or same, the same premises that, that he went with Abraham and Isaac. Now he's relaying over onto Jacob. The land wherein thou liest. He made a promise that he would give them the Canaan lands. To thee will I give it and to thy seed. Not only that, he's, he promises that, Abra that Jacob will have seed. Ooh, excuse me. That he will have seed. Verse 14 further uh, promotes the idea that Jacob will have seed. But not only will you have seed, you're going to have a great many seed. Now, Jacob of all the three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had the most. And this is why we, we, we refer to them as the 12 children of Israel. 
because Jacob later becomes Israel. He, he's renamed by the Lord Israel because he's no longer Jacob the supplanter. He's a changed man. He is now the prince of the prince of God's people. So let me go forward. Verse 14. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. Now, this sounds familiar because he God has also said this in, in so many ways to Abraham and Isaac. To Abraham, he said, your, your seed shall be as the stars of heaven. You will not be able to count the stars in heaven. That's how much your seed will be in quantity. Uh, he makes the same idea that Isaac's sons and, and his children will be a great many people. And this one right here, Jacob is now as the sand of the sea. Go ahead on the beach and try to count the sand. You're going to be there uh, many, many lifetimes. And even then, you're going to lose count and not know that you are not ever going to be finished counting sand. This is how much your children is going to be on the face. As you can tell, I just transformed into a whole nother day. Uh, it's a whole nother day. It's a whole nother weather type. Uh, and uh, it's a... Because my phone heated, overheated, and the video stopped midway. So we begin, uh, we commence at verse 14, the latter clause. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, this is God talking to Jacob in a dream and telling him the exact same, uh, in, in, in so many words, the exact same thing that he had said to Abraham and also to Isaac. And now he's saying it to I uh, to Jacob and he says, verse 15, and behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. This tells me, and of course, this today's lesson, uh, this is the key verse for today's lesson, verse 15. Uh, one thing that you want to take from this is that when God speaks a word in your life or promises anything in your life, or you could take any one of God's promises in his word, and so long as they relate to you, then you can take that promise and cash that, that check right now. Because uh, when God tells you something, it's for sure going to happen. And he's not going to rest. He's not going to slumber or sleep. He's not going to get tired. He's not going to get... Uh, sick and tired of you. He's not going to get, you know, um, so disgusted with you that 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 he just allows you just to be released and let go, and and then he leaves you and all that other good stuff. So long as you keep that word, so long as you keep your faith and your hope in that word, God will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Only way, the only way the the bond that can, the, that God has tied to us through his word can be broken is that if we leave him by not believing in his word, by not taking his word at, at what it is, face value. Face value, when he says, I will bless you, it means ver that very thing, I will bless you. He says, I am with thee. It means that very thing, that every type of trouble that you're going to come across, I am with you. I am bigger than that trouble. I can protect you. And if you go, if you're hungry, I will feed you. If you're thirsty, I will give you drink. And we saw that time and time again with the children of Israel as they went through in the future uh, in the wilderness. God protected the children of Israel because of these promises. And the children of Israel were abhorrent. They kept turning back. And then come, kept on repenting, and they kept turning back, kept repenting, and kept turning back. But God was with them. His word was ever with them. And so long as they had that worship epicenter, you know, Moses, Aaron, the, the priesthood, the, the, the tabernacle, all that, that stuff kept them in line. Their word, their scrolls, their parchments, their, the, the five books of the Torah. All of that kept them in line and kept them close to God. And so long as they had that standard that they were next to at all times, they were not going to be let go. And uh, they, they knew that they can run to it. They knew that they could turn to God. They still had faith, although very weak. They still had faith in the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And so we see uh, this blessing uh, passed down to Jacob, the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham, who is the father of the 12 children of Israel, who goes on and makes history 
with God having their back throughout history, throughout human history. We see that even today that there are people, remnants of the children of Israel that are persecuted for being Jewish, for being, you know, God's chosen people. And people don't like like even that title to be applied to them. There's a demonic spirit in this world that don't like the word of God that was spoken over this people. And so because this demonic spirit works in a lot of people, not just white folk, not just, you know, Arabs, not just people who, who historically hated Jews, not just Nazis, but it means all people. And to some degree, every color of people, every race of people, every um, I've come across every type, even Jewish people, self-hate. And that's a spirit, that's a demonic spirit that goes against the word of God. The word of God has already gone forth. The word of God has been spoken. And we see that in this verse, verse 15, which is today's key verse, um, that he says that God, Yahweh says, I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And so everything that he has spoken will come to pass. Let me move on. Uh, verse 16, and Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. And so he he had a dream and it was so very real to him that he marked this place as the place where the Lord was and he did not know it. And so he was awake. And remember, I told you before that when he was asleep, that he used the pillar, the, 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 the stones for a pillow. Well, now he has awoken out of his sleep and he has stopped utilizing that stone as a pillow and awoke out of his sleep. And now he's about to utilize that stone as a pillar to know and to be to be awakened to the fact that God is here, that God is with me. I'm awake now. I don't need to sleep anymore. I'm not asleep anymore. And I hope you guys know what I'm saying. Not just physically sleeping, taking a nap. Uh, so verse 17. Uh, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And so where, where did he get the idea that this is the gate of heaven? The idea came, comes from the dream that he had. He had a, a dream of a ladder that was set on earth. Now, where he was dreaming was a place called Luz, which was, a, a, if I'm not mistaken, a Hittite city of the Canaan land. And so originally it was called Luz, but he had awakened out of his sleep and from his dream and gave it a new name. He called it Bethel, the house of God. Why? Because this is the gate to heaven. And so if there's a gate to heaven, there is a gate to God's house. And so God, may, he may not have thought that God dwelt on the land there, but he knew that there was a gate there that led to God's house. And this place is dreadful. And, and, and you know, he, he was fearing, uh, not the kind of fear that you tremble because you are uh, scared of something, but because you are respectful, you are dreadfully aware of how, how, um, the gravitas, I, I'm not sure if anybody knows what that means, the, the, the heaviness of this place, the, the heaviness of the meaning of this place is to him the house of God, the gate to heaven because of what he had dreamed, that he had dreamed a ladder that, um, that bridged from earth to heaven. And that the very God that he, that he heard of from his father and his grandfather and his family, that now that God has spoken to him. And now he's afraid, he, he's dread, uh, he regards this place as a dreadful place. And so um, verse 18 says, And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar. So he replaced the use of a pillow, you know, for sleep. And he awoke out of his dream, out of his sleep. And he replaced the idea of being asleep and at rest to a uh, to a place where he's recogn uh, recognizing or recognizant of the the idea that God is in this place 
that God has met me, that God has spoken to me, that the gate of heaven was open to me, that a ladder was approached unto me, that God made a bridge from heaven to the earth for me so that he can speak from that bridge and speak a word into my life. And so he says, until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And so now he call, he makes that stone which he slept on a pillar and poured oil upon top on the top of it as to memorialize it as to sanctify it as to sanctify this very place where he had uh, previously slept. And so I think it's very um is foreshadowy. You know, you know we don't have to sleep anymore on the idea or the notion that God is with us. We we sleep all the time as Christians knowing the truth but not really knowing the truth, not experiencing and having it manifest to us on a daily basis, on a life, you know, lifetime from here, from this moment to that moment, to that moment, to the point that we die, to the point that we go to heaven, God is going to be ever with us. And that is a truthful reality to us. But this has become a reality to Jacob. It's no longer a story that Abraham and Isaac had told them. It's no longer a story about, oh, when you were a child, God spoke this in, in my, in my, while you were in my womb. You know, Rebecca's stories of, of Jacob, all this other stuff. All that stuff is all in fairy tales at that point. This is now reality. God has spoken to him. And all the things where he might have regarded as fairy tales and, and old wise fables and tales of, you know, to astonish these things that he, he grew up on had become a reality in that God has spoken to him in a dream. Now, when that happens to each and every one of you, or when that happens to each and every one of you in some form or fashion, not everybody doesn't get visited uh, by, by God in a dream. Everybody doesn't get visited by God in, you know, accidents and deathbeds and stuff like that. Everybody is different. God will speak to everybody differently, but he will speak nonetheless. And when you realize that he is speaking nonetheless, you can now go to this and say, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Everything he has spoken will come to pass. And so we, um, we're, we're exiting the dream and he, is, he rose up early in the morning, took the stone which he had made for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, which is translated the house of God. But the name of the city was called Luz at first. Luz being a Hittite city. I did make a, a note on there. Verse 20, and Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me. Now, Jacob had just been visited by God in a dream. And now he's talking about some if. This reminds me of, you know, the idea that Isaac Isaac's servant, you know, Abraham's servant went and looked for Rebecca and he put out a prayer that, you know, very specific type of prayer. He said, oh, let me let me find a woman for my master, my Lord, so that he can be happy with this person. And if I found favor in the, in the sight of the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, uh, God of Isaac, then you will do this in this way. And she will come not only to give me a water, uh, give me some water to drink, but she will also show hospitality and give my camels to drink. And then, then I will know. Then I will know that that was that's the one. Something like um, with Gideon as well. Gideon also fleeced God. He he said in the prayer, "Look, God, if this be your will, show me no dew on the fleece the next morning." If it be your will. And God shows him do on the fleece. And then he said, okay, again, I'm just going to make sure, God, make sure. If this be your will, show me no, no, no do on the fleece the next morning. You know, vice versa. I don't remember which way it went. But either way, he was, he was fleecing God. That's called a fleecing prayer. A prayer where you're, you're act, asking God to do something to confirm something he has already said. Instead of just believing and just going with what he's already said, which is not a problem, it's not an issue, but God would rather that you just believe. But in, in this language, in verse 20, Jacob is saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go 
and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And so he's in essence saying, OK, I heard the word. I believe you. I'm, I'm fearing for my life. I believe that this actually happened and I made a pillar. I made a memorial. This is all, you know, this is truth. But seeing is believing. I'm just going to wait till the I'm, I'm going to wait till my change come. I'm going to wait till the, the thing that was spoken to me of comes to pass. Then God will be my God. Now, shouldn't God be your God even before the prayer is answered? I would say yes. And I think Jacob, um, you know, hindsight being 2020, J Jacob would probably say yes, too. He would agree with me. Lewis, you know, you're right. I should have believed God to begin with. But humanity is humanity. We're all the same. We're all cut from the same flesh cloth. We all bleed the same. We all think the same. There's nothing new under the sun. Uh, you know, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. We all have um, have taken part of that in our life. And we all succumb to the weaknesses of our flesh. And Jacob also, in in his statement, is is pretty weak. And this is my this is my opinion, but this is... You know, when you say, if God will be with me after God said, I will be with you, it's kind of weak to say, look, if God will be with me. And look, I'm weak too. I don't say it all the time that what God has told me in my life, that I'm so sure of it. I, I, you know, I'm not holier than anybody to, to think that, you know, everything God told me, oh, it's going to come to pass. You know, I have my reservations at times. I have my doubts. But my faith is rooted in the word of God, in the knowledge of him, in the experience that I already have. I'm building upon that. Jacob is building upon what he has received. He has received not only knowledge from his parents, you know, stories. The, the stories that his parents told him is dropped down to him. He has received that and he's believed it in so far as that he's not, he doesn't believe that his grandfather, his father, his mother, all of them has been lying to him all this time. He believes it. It's a foundation. But we need that foundation to be built upon. We have the Bible. We have the scripture. But we need the, 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 the foundation to be built upon. We don't look to the foundation for life all the time. But we do regard it as a stabilizing force in our life. We, we, we trust in God in that we believe that there is a God through scripture. And also through witness and testimony through people around us. But when it becomes real to us, that now becomes our foundation. That now becomes, you know, extra pillars around our pillars. So much so that the foundation is rock solid. And so we build upon that. We must build upon that. And I think this is where Jacob is finding himself. And so if God will be with me. And will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house. You already said and will bring thee again. Verse 15 into this land. So God said it. I'm, I'm going to bring to you again in this land. That means you will not die at the hand of your brother Esau. You don't even have to be afraid of Esau. But guess what? Jacob was afraid. He was still he was still hesitant in coming back. And so that he, he created this caravan of family, showed his, his children, his wife, his wives, uh, his servants, his sheep, all this stuff. All this caravan went before and he went last. And so by the time Esau came to his caravan where Jacob was, Esau was like, what is all this? Don't you know all that is behind me? I love you, my brother. <laughs> Come to me. Embrace me. I love you. I've put that in the past and God made good on his word. He softened the blow. He softened the blow for Esau in that he made him, you know, uh, he tempered Esau down and he, according to the word of his mother, you know, until he cools down, <laughs> then you will come back. Jacob was still afraid for his life. He thought he was going to die. He thought Esau was going to slay him still. And so let's come on. Let's go on with, where am I? Verse 20, verse 21, the latter clause. Then shall the Lord Yahweh be my God. And this stone, the stone he used for a pillow, which I have set for a pillar 
shall be God's house. Now, a stone is not God's house. It's representative of God's house, meaning that the dream he had is a spiritual one in nature, that it is the gate of heaven. Like he said, surely this place is all dreadful, please. Um, and this is the gate of heaven. And so he uses this stone to represent the house of God, but the house of God is a heavenly place, is a spiritual place, is in a spiritual realm. You don't see a house where anyone dwells in. It is a stone that, that demarks a spiritual reason. And so Jacob puts this stone here, and in his dream, he makes the, the, the association with his dream to this stone, to this place. We can do the very same thing. We, we, we have been visited by God in certain places, especially in our churches, excuse me, especially in our churches. We have been visited in our specific local house of worship. That's where God came to meet us. Every now and again, I go back to my, my church, Emmanuel Church of Christ, and I remember the day that I received the Holy Ghost. I received doctrine. I received teaching. I received the love and the embrace of the people of God in that place. That was God to me. God introduced himself to me there. And that will always be where God, that will always be the house of God to me. Even though I have a different church, I, I've gone on to another church. God has moved me to a different place. Um... It doesn't, it doesn't matter. That place is now a pillar for me. That place is now representative. It is a gate of heaven for me. And so in this case, Jacob did the very same thing. Bethel is not an actual place where God says, I'm going to live. As a matter of fact, he sets up a house on earth through Solomon later in history. And that's in the high place, Jerusalem, which is Zion, the hill. The holy hill. And that, that's not Bethel. Even though Bethel is close by, that's not Bethel. And so let me continue. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now this is speaking of when all this happened. Remember he says, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. This means that at the end of God saying every, that everything that God said, when it is fulfilled, then he will do everything that shall follow. Meaning Jacob will do this. Then shall the Lord be my God. This stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me from this time forward, when this has come to pass, all the words that you told me, then I will do this. Uh, of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Meaning this was not something that he gave all the time. He did not do this every Sunday. He did not do this every Saturday. He, not did, he did not do this any time of the month, every month. He did not do this yearly, every year. He did this when this word was fulfilled. It was a memorial. It was an appreciation offering unto God for making good on his word. And Jacob's dream was the word of God to Jacob. And so what else can we take from this? Jacob's dream, Jacob represents, remember now, Abraham represents the seed of God. The seed of God is in Abraham and is passed through Sarah and goes through to Isaac and Rebekah. And it goes to Jacob and his wives and his children and through his children on and on and on through generations and generations up until the seed is manifest who God has intended all along Jesus Christ to come forth from the, the, the seed in the loins of Abraham, from the loins of Noah, from the loins of Adam. These all are people that come from the first man and has course corrected in the last man, which is which we, who we call Jesus. And so the last man is called the son of man. He is Jesus. Jesus himself, now I'm going to go back to that scripture in 1 John. Oh, 1 John. John chapter 1. Going back to that scripture, and I'm going to lay out something there that is very, very um, important. We must rightly divide the word of truth. And when we read John chapter 1, verse 49 through 51, we must, we must see that Jesus came for the lost house of the, the sheep of Israel. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. I got it all mixed up. 
And so his mission was to course correct not only humanity, but start first with the Jewish nation. Start first with the Israelites. And this is his mission. And what does he do first? He now has his message. He is by himself. Now he needs disciples. He needs apostles. He chooses the apostles. And he comes lastly in this particular chapter to Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel was, was approached by Philip. Philip says to Nathaniel, can um, he find it? Uh, Philip was, Beth, uh, was, was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathaniel and said unto him, We have found him, though uh, him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Talking of Nathanael. Now, Jesus speaks highly of this man, Nathanael, but he speaks and he promotes the idea that this is an Israelite in whom is no guile. I'm going to approach this Israelite and I'm going to make him one of my apostles. You are an Israelite. Israelite, ding, 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 one of those key words, Israelite, Israelite, if you didn't get it by now, I've come for the Israelites, I have chosen you 12 so that you 12 can promote my good word, promote the kingdom of God to the Israelites first, and then also to the Gentiles later on. But right now, we're speaking of the Israelites. The focus is Israelites. Now, why do I know that this is the, the focus of the Israelites? Because as you read on, you say, it says, uh, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no God, Jesus says of Nathanael. Nathanael said say unto him, Whence knowest thou me? How do you know me, Jesus? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. This is now about to blow Nathanael's mind, because how could this man, who was somewhere else, know where I was somewhere else that same day before Philip called me? Who can know that? Surely not a human being on earth can know or can be somewhere else present at the same time. This man definitely got word from God, a message from God. Surely this Jesus is a prophet. Surely this Jesus is divine in some kind of way or divinely inspired in some kind of way. Now I can listen to this guy. Wow, you just blew my mind. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. And then Jesus said, answered and said, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree. Believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. So he questions like, Just because I said this, Just because I gave you a little bit of hidden knowledge About where you were, That, that blew your mind? I'm about to blow your mind, alright? And this is what he says, To this Israelite, Concerning Israelites, he says, thou shalt see greater things than these. Where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in these places. And he said unto them, verily, verily, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels, and you shall see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is directly taking the concept of what was Jacob's dream. Uh, the, the heavens open up, angels ascending and descending upon the ladder. So what does that make the Son of Man? The Son of Man is the ladder. The ladder is a bridge from heaven to earth. I've, I've already mentioned this, but I think it bear, uh, bears re, uh, repeating. And that uh, the Son of Man is the gateway to heaven. J Jacob said it himself. Surely this is the... Uh, and this is the gate of heaven in verse 17 of today's lesson. And so Jesus is not only just a ladder set up on earth to reach heaven and heaven to reach earth. And you have the angels of God ascending and descending upon him. But you have the word of God coming forth. You have miraculous things. This is what Jesus was referring to. Miraculous things was about to happen. And who's going to see it? The Israelites. Who's making good on his word? God is making good on his word from atop of that ladder and making his word known to the people down at the bottom of that ladder. 
and he has now bridged the gap. He has now reached his arm by his son, by Jesus Christ, by the extension of himself, God himself manifest in flesh. He has now extended himself to the Israelites, to Nathaniel, to the apostles, and to anyone who will believe the, the message of the gospel to the kingdom. The kingdom of God is now being preached to the Israelites first and then later to the Gentiles. But like I said, the focus here is the Israelites. And where do the Israelites come from? Who are the Israelites? They are the children of Israel. Israel being the, cert, the new name of Jacob. Jacob being the, the, the promised seed of Isaac. Isaac being the seed of Abraham. Abraham being given the, the word of promise. You know, from the very beginning, this is the law that we go by. That we have a word of promise. That if we reach unto that word of promise, we will receive it. The just shall live by his faith. My faith has reached to Jesus. How is that possible? Because Jesus is the ladder or the hand of God that has now reached out to us. We can now make contact with God through Jesus Christ. We can now go on the rungs of that ladder. Now, I know it's not, not a wooden ladder. We can now climb the stairway to heaven. We can now go one foot in front of the other in the direction up above in a heavenly bound direction because of Jesus. That was Jacob's dream. Jacob's dream, it all starts with Jacob and him still being with the Lord. Remember, the I mentioned it in times past. When God set up Abraham on this earth, he set up a culture. It was supposed to be done with Terah, his father. Remember, the story began with Terah. These are the generations of Terah. But Terah, his heart was still attached to his idol gods. And Terah died, but now the story went on with Abraham and God made Abraham the focus of, the, of his story. And so then from there on, these are the generations of of the sons of uh, um, of Isaac. I think it says Isaac in, in one time. But um, that's the whole story. Jacob's dream. It is relatable to us. Because of Jacob's, you know, because of Jacob's um, purpose in his life and him going forward and his children eventually coming to all of his history and to Jesus and even to today's, um, today's day and age, we can approach God because of the ladder or the gateway to heaven, Jesus Christ, the, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, seed of Jacob. God bless you all, and I hope you enjoyed that lesson. Bye-bye.